So everybody, welcome. Um, it looks like we have uh, uh, several folks in here. I've enabled the waiting room so that you all should be able to just filter in, no problem. Um, Stephen Brower is with us. Uh, this is the person I've been talking to all of you about this semester. Um, Stephen is a graphic designer, uh, author. Um, he's the head honcho uh, at Marywood University uh, for the Get Your Masters with the Masters MFA program. Uh, and that is in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, and, um, you know, I was a student there and, um, you know, it was really great. You know, um, it was easy to, to pursue the master's without having to commute or up, upend myself and move somewhere else completely for four years. Um, you know, low residency, really simple. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd have to be there in the summer for a few weeks, then either a week in the fall in either Philly or NYC, and also uh, a week in the, in the spring, either in Philly or NYC. Um, and, you know, it's a great program uh, and I'll just plug it for a second, just from what I remember. And you can, you know, add anything you'd like, Stephen. Um, but the talks were amazing. Um, any of you who are interested in illustration and graphic design and wanting to pursue an MFA, this is a really great program. Um, and actually one of two, unless that's changed, right? Like I think Rhode Island does an MFA low residency, right, Stephen? Uh, uh, well, Huntington does for, for illustration. Okay. And it's just the two of you, right? Like it's just Scranton and Huntington. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not very many options for the low residency MFA where you can sort of just like stay here in Tennessee in Murfreesboro and then just sort of commute to do grad school. Um, and I think that was probably the most attractive thing about it to me, um, was that I just I couldn't find any other program quite like it. Um, in addition to that, they put you in front of these creative people. Um, you know, I think traditionally education is done in the classroom and it's sort of done to you. Um, but on these study tours in New York and also in Philly, they put us inside of the studios of these amazing illustrators and graphic designers. Um, and so I think that that's huge, right? Because that's not something that I see happening um, as often as it should in, 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 in undergrad. Um, as, as well as MFA uh, programs. Um, so that's my little bit on that. Um, it was a great experience. It helped me to grow as a human being um, and it helped me to become who I am today. So I owe a lot to that program um, and definitely look into it if you're looking to further your illustration and graphic design education. Are there any plugs that you'd like to put in for that, Stephen? No, I think you did a great job. So just so you all know, I hope your undergrads know, you, you, you're like our star alumni. Um, Tony, Tony is the, one of the top illustrators today. And- um, Thank and, you, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And so he also gave me a completely daunting task to uh, do the history of illustration in just two hours. <laughs> I don't know how far I'm going to get. I, I prepared quite a bit. Uh, so we start at the beginning, um, which are the cave paintings, uh, because these are the first artists and the first illustrators, because they were trying to communicate something to us. Uh, this is from Lacau, France. Um, if anybody speaks French, forgive my French accent. Um, uh, but this goes back to uh, 35 BC to roughly uh, 4000 BC. We actually do not know why they were painting on walls of uh, animals. Uh, we can take guesses. Either it was the hunt, the current hunt that uh, took place, or perhaps it was the hope for a good hunt. Um, but we do know that they were communicating something to each other. And that goes across all um, all different cultures, as you can see here. And then also, um, um, this is India. And here it's not painting, but they're taking the time to carve into stone. Australia, uh, and then um, Native Americans. Um, these actually didn't last because they're sand paintings, but they would create the same kind of imagery in sand. And and then uh, uh, we as humans stop being nomadic and we um, settled down roughly around 8,000 BC and we began hieroglyphics 
And so hieroglyphics is also telling stories. In fact, it's telling stories uh, in sequential art. And so you read it from right to left, top to bottom. But these are actually panels, just like a comic book or a comic strip um, or a graphic novel today. And so these are, again, the earliest forms of storytelling, which is what um, illustration is all about. And then jumping ahead quite a bit, we get to the illuminated manuscripts, which were Bibles for um, put out by the church, created by monks who would spend, you know, six, six months or more working on these books and here telling the story of the Bible. And then that also would move across cultures. I love these. These are uh, Spanish um, illuminated manuscripts. And they're working again in those panels, the sequential art panels. But I also, I just love the flatness and the coloring of, of these. I think they're remarkable. And then uh, Albert um, Dora, who... Um, was uh, this is around the time or a little bit after the Gutenberg press and he really perfected engraving so that you could before this it was very dense and he added a lot of negative space and white this is also from the bible it's the four Hor horsemen of the apocalypse and so that's roughly 1500 which is what the uh, illuminated manuscripts were just a little bit prior uh, and then um, I'm jumping way ahead. By the way, when we get to the 20th century, I'm going to be focusing on American illustration. Um, but this is just to give you a solid background. And so William Morris was the founder of the Kemslot Press and the head of um, the arts and crafts movement. And he um, not only illustrated um, his own books, but he um, created the typography and he wrote them as well. Uh, so he was a real Renaissance person. But his his inspiration were the illuminated manuscripts. Uh, but bringing it up to date to roughly 1850, there's another another one of his uh, illustrations. So so again, 17th century Japanese art white background for negative space outlines for the figures and then these incredible you know patterns within and what happened in paris uh in the late 1800s roughly 1880 around there is um travel became much better between um uh europe and asia and um, French sol uh, sailors were bringing these prints back and they became extremely popular with the um, Parisians and they were hanging up in almost every home uh, in Paris at that time. So the reason that's important is it influences Art Nouveau and Art Nouveau literally means new art. It is... Um, uh, this is by Charest, and um, you can see, even though the background's dark, lots of negative space, outlines, and then color within. So there's the um, Japanese influence. Toulouse-Lautrec, who also is, you know, well known as an artist, but he was also an illustrator and graphic artist. Uh, and again, white space for the background, um, outlines and then one of his more famous um moulin rouge posters um what's really interesting is he makes the can can dress white and so even though there's a foreground and a background um she without question is the center of attention and then you get to one of my favorites alphonse Mucha. and there he was and so Alphonse Mucher was uh, born in Czechoslovakia and moved to, um, to Paris. And um, there was P.T. Barnum, 
who was a famous promoter, was um, Sarah Bernhard's um, manager. Sarah Bernhard was the most famous uh, actress uh, in the world. She toured all over the world in uh, in theater and was a, cele a big celebrity of the day. And uh, P.T. Barnum, who many of you probably know the name from Barnum and Bailey Circus, but before that was a promoter. He was also the first uh, person to create a museum uh, in, in the United States, which was in New York, um, which had oddities in it, like uh, a mermaid, and the mermaid was actually the top half of a monkey sewn to the bottom half of a fish. Um, but I digress. Uh, he had a, um, a poster competition and Alphonse Mucha won the competition. And so here um, you can see that Japanese influence of the white background and the um, outline and uh, all his own typography and design as well. And then he also designed um, champagne uh, labels. And some um, textile design. And then he did a lot of posters for Sarah Bernhardt as well. Beer of the Muse. And so one thing I do want you to note is the, this patterning of the hair, because that's sort of a keynote of um, Art Nouveau. And by the way, he did not do these engravings. The, those are from uh, the company, but he put them into there, but that's his type and illustration. Chocolate. Cigarettes. You can really see the hair there. So he was a commercial artist or a commercial illustrator. More champagne. So Aubrey Beardsley. <laughs> um, so art director and a publisher at around age 22 in London. Um, he, um, these are all illustrations from books that he also designed. Um, he, he, he was a ce celebrity unto his own right. One of the reasons um, is he also did a lot of pornographic books. Uh, and for decorum, I'm not going to show any of those, but they were banned in England, uh, and um, but they were published in France uh, in his lifetime. The, all these illustrations are from Salome. And this one I just love. Um, to me, it, it almost looks like a glazer. Um, it, it's just a remarkable illustration sort of timeless and look at that just the use of spots spotted blacks and line art here with the uh, borders similar to the illuminated manuscripts oh so he uh he idolized uh william morris and and said that publicly and william morris wasn't pleased because, as I said, uh, Beersley had a reputation as a pornographer, and uh, Morris went so far as to sue him for libel, and he lost the case. And there's a book plate that he, you know, cover a uh, title page that he designed. Uh, Howard Pyle, who uh, is considered the father of American illustration. And uh, what's interesting is that Art Nouveau movement moved all over the world. It went to Germany, it went to uh, 
the United States, but this is a completely different school of illustration, but it's happening around the same time. And so um, there was Mr. Pyle. Uh, so he he was he formed the Brandywine School, which is right outside of uh, Philadelphia. And he taught what the reason he's considered the father is he taught so many people and we'll see um, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of them. But um, here's this is from uh, uh, um, oh treasure what was what, what's the book called the treasure pirate Island. book I'm sorry Treasure Island yes and so the thing to note about Pyle's work is his use of color because he'll make everything almost monochromatic and then have one usually red color bringing everything to the front as you can see there and then the blue giving a highlight as well but very uh, realistic dramatic here that amazing gold um and ju just a remarkable uh, image this image has been um, 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 either parodied or paid homage to many many times that ship I mean, boy, you can really feel the wetness of the of the deck there. And just, you know, his composition is amazing. Um, you probably guess I have a thing for negative space because it makes it so dramatic and just you know you just really feel the distance in between them and and the wolf on the move look at the lighting there and a slightly different style more more of the line art style King Arthur And again, just the drama of the uh, composition. There's there's a tendency with artists to try to fill up every space, and that's why I think it's important to you know. I mean, here everything's filled up, but but then you get those really dramatic sort of empty spaces, and if you think of it in terms of reading the book. The drama is even greater when you get to that. Some black and white. So these are all oil paintings, the color ones. That mermaid was wild. I don't think I'd seen that one. Wait, which one? I think it was a mermaid coming out of the oak. That blue, mermaid. yeah. Yeah. That's Howard Pyle? Yeah. It's wild. I hadn't seen that one. That's cool. Like just everything. The, the, yeah. The bead, the bead and the jewelry and the hair. and that's Yeah. Cool. The skin tone. And the lighting, yes, it's yeah. He he he's absolutely astounding. And there he was in the studio. And he wrote and illustrated a lot of his own stories as well.
I love the page design, how it works around his illustration. And simplified pen and ink. So you can see he's really quite uh, prolific as well. Look at that one. So as I said, he started the Brandywine School. And so these are some of his pupils uh, and some working in a very similar style. Uh, um, so this is done. That composition is very similar to that uh, pile. but using more of a sepia palette. And uh, the subject matter being more Westerns. And N.C. Wyeth? I have, a, I have a quick question about Harvey. Yeah. Was he the one, was he the one of uh, Powell's students who was like, um, I don't think, I don't remember the exact terminology for it, but uh, like a war, a war recorder, like a journalistic illustrator. In I, yes, yes, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there you go. Yeah, it, it would have been the First World War. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And see, Wyeth, some of you may know Andrew Wyeth, who is his son. Um, uh, what, what's the name of the painting with the girl looking up at the house? I'm blanking on it right now. There, there's a, a famous painting by his son, but this is the dad. Is it something like Chris's world or Christina's, Christina's world? world? Yeah, 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 yeah. These are his book illustrations, but you'll see he did a lot of advertising as well. And then Jamie wife is the grandson. So there's three generations of, of um, Wyeth's. I love the composition of this. And the reflection, just the the sky. But here you see the pile influence, right? There you go. Advertising. And here working in Japanese um, style. That's a uh, Coca-Cola ad. Oh yeah, you can see it. It's cut off on my screen, but you can see it. Here you go. Lots of advertising. And Effie uh, Schoonover.
You know, it's interesting too, is all these illustrators, American illustrators are post-impressionism. And yet you don't see much of that influence uh, on their art. Or, or Art Nouveau. They really had their own, their own school, which here is the Brandywine School. This is the Howard Pyle and the Brandywine School and all that. This is considered the golden age, right? Yeah. Of illustration, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, what's really interesting is that um, he had women uh, students who became famous illustrators for the first time. Um, up until this point, the history is all of men. However, there was, I don't know if you heard, heard this, there was a recent discovery of a skull of a woman from the time of the media, uh, uh, of the illuminated manuscripts, and she had blue dye on her teeth. And so for the first time, they're beginning to rethink whether it was only male monks creating the illuminated manuscripts, or perhaps the nuns were creating them as well. I so wouldn't... I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, yeah. if, I, if I remember like Renaissance, um, like the Renaissance period, I think that it was, you know, folks like, um, what, what were their names? Um, somebody named Anguissola, Sophonisba Anguissola. Right, yes, um, yes. And they, I think that, I think I forget if she was a governess or if she was a nun. But it was more likely that if you were going to see paintings in the Renaissance, or at least in the slides that my instructor and my undergrad showcased to us, that they were likely already working within the church. And it was likely that if they were working in the church, that they were nuns. So that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. That's interesting. Yeah. So Violet Oakley's one of the um, first uh, well-known uh, illust women illustrators in the U.S. Something I always kind of wondered and, and what I've never really been sure about, maybe it's something you know, you know, some of these, uh, you know, like Schoonover stuff and you know, on the covers of these magazines, obviously they're working with traditional media. <laughs> and so I guess I just wonder like what the turnaround time would have been, you know, for a weekly or a monthly, you know, in that time. Uh, I can only answer with my own experience because when I got into the business, we were still commissioning paintings for book covers. Wow. You know, full, full, you know, oil paintings. And I think it wasn't long. I think it was about a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, they were gigantic. We would get these massive paintings for, you know, a, a five by eight book cover. Mm -hmm. and we have to send them out to be uh, photographed um and uh yeah i i i, I i'm going to say a month was seen seems about the you know from the time they were hired in rough sketches to to finish mm -hmm. and they were paid um two thousand three thousand dollars for a book cover back then this is 198 late 80s and I'm assuming they kept the pieces, like the, the artist kept the piece. Oh, uh, so this is absolutely heartbreaking, but the publisher kept the piece. <laughs> and and that that was the industry standard is they never returned the art. And so when I worked at New American Library, and that was nine, 1986, there was art everywhere some of it fortunately was hanging up mm -hmm. like Milton Glaser hopefully we'll get to him um, his Shakespeare um, art 
but others were like in in these bins just shoved in there uh, and they were not considered of any value that's wild. and it, 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 it now i think back but you know i didn't know any better because nobody seemed to know any better yeah yeah and it, it's really uh it, it's just terrible but yeah no publishers and comic book publishers do not return the art that's what i was going to say yeah it was the same thing in the comic book industry too a lot of times not just for covers for interior artwork the publisher would just hang on to it and you were lucky to get it back a lot of times if you were the artist yeah. or if you did get it back it may not even be in the same condition you sent it in yeah <laughs> yeah so no it, it wouldn't um yeah I, I mean it's some of that art was just like lying all over the floor the airbrusher would use it as um a stencil it it just i i think if i could go back in time mm -hmm. with a, a, a giant truck i would clean out the place it's it's just amazing but we, no uh, this amazing art we're, we're looking at and there just wasn't any value placed on it other than for print it was considered this is for print and that's it yeah crazy what an easy way to be and, and an affordable way to become an art collector you know just <laughs> become an art director or a publish publishing company yeah, work for a publishing company yeah well i do know the glazer disappeared at some point so, so somebody took it home <laughs> <laughs> So Violet Oakley and a mural. Look at that. A mural she painted. And a detail. Oh, it's it's on the uh, you know beginnings of the United States. Elizabeth uh, shipping green. I remember Elizabeth uh, Shippen Green being the first illustrator, um, like in the American section that I remember like identifying with, like the aesthetic of it. Um, Interesting. Wow. Like, this is very nostalgic for me to see this. Like, just I mean, look at it. <laughs> it's it. There's like an immediacy to it, but a complexity to it, and um, I think they had some. I mean, I'm sure that they have some of this in the SOI's permanent collection. I, yeah, I remember, I remember seeing this hanging, like, or one of her, or several of her pieces hanging on the second floor, and immediately identifying with it myself. Yeah, it's just beautiful work. And yet again, you can see the pile influence with color. So Maxwell um, Parrish also studied um, with Pyle at Brandywine. I, I absolutely love his work too. It's it's almost cartoony. It's very stylized, but just just delightful. I have a print of this frame somewhere. I think Maxfield's the the illustrator who has that that scene with all of the lanterns, like the glowing lanterns, right? I think so, yeah. That's the one that sticks out for me of that body of work. So book illustration. Just look I just love the design of that with the checkered floor and perspective and the Emperor. And that that intense blue he's also known for. Um, I don't know what, what color would that blue be? It's very saturated looking.
all his colors have that they're really keyed up I don't know what, what was going on in the last, <laughs> the last picture Amazing use of lighting. There it is. Yeah, is that amazing? It's so great. It's like otherworldly, you know, just the the foundations principles, but then also the navigation away from foundations principles, like that nice balance between the two. And how he gets those saturated colors you know they're they're um I, i'm thinking they're inks not not paint but still it's you know he's singular in that and i i'm not sure what he used for that but i used to think you know having seen so much of his stuff on slides that maybe some folks were like messing with the saturation of his images <laughs> online yeah they're not and they're yeah. not right they're oh. that's how that's how they look yeah, they absolutely do, and uh, but they come across even in printed books. These colors come across like this, and I, I can't think of anybody else that that's able to do that. So, also a very successful illustrator of the early part of the 20th century. Love that one. You know, I forget how much I love this work, a lot of this work. Because when I'm projecting on the screen and lecturing in class, I'm not really looking at it. And, and you know, sitting here looking on my laptop, I'm really appreciating it all over again. Just an amazing composition. And then James Montgomery Flagg, most famous for this image, for um, uh, World War One, the First World War. And he actually did several posters, but that one, that one stuck. And he gave us our um, modern um, image of uh, Uncle Sam. Not a particularly happy Uncle Sam there. There's a really different one. That almost looks like it's from the 60s. It's so interesting when that happens because I don't, I never really understand why, like, like to bring back the Renaissance for, for a second, um, you could rifle through the slides of the Renaissance, like the Italian and Southern Northern Renaissance. And apart from like the manuscripts um, and maybe even apart from like the engravings, the painting tends to look so similar. And then all of a sudden somebody like Pontormo does these like intense, bright, saturated, hot, 
pinks that it, it just didn't make any sense to me. It's like, where did this come from? And why didn't anyone else adjacent to him do it? And it just remains this sort of like mystery. Like, why was that like that when nothing else was like it at the time? Right. Yeah. Doug smiling at the mark making here. Yeah, because I always love seeing his pen and ink work because he was, it seems like he was highly influenced by Charles Dana Gibson, who also love. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shared a lot of similar mark making. Seems like his are a little bit more like lush in the way that they're distributed. Because um, I know he had more of like a painting background, but yeah, his stuff, it's, it's insane. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yep. Uh, um, J.C. Leyendecker, contemporary and also extremely popular illustrator. He, he's really famous for these hour shirt ads, among other things, Saturday evening post covers. Probably the most famous um, illustrator of that early part of the 20th century. Um, and there's a museum in his name that used to be uh, near his home. And um, he always worked in oil. Here's a famous self portrait. I've seen a lot of parodies of this over the years. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. One of his most famous images. I love that. It's what we're doing right now, right? And uh, that's what most of you uh, look like as students, right? With the grip pen and the tab of the iPad. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's funny. Oddly enough, Norman Rockwell's paintings were nostalgic within their own time. And it wasn't so much here he's painting, probably a slightly earlier time of Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn, but e even his current painting, I, 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 maybe one of you could um, uh, explain it, but right, there's like a nostalgia to his work. And it's not just us looking back, It's I think it's actually how he approached the work as well. I guess maybe a romanticism, which turns into nostalgia. Um, but I, I think that runs throughout his work. Yeah, I, I particularly, I think I receive it and have always sort of received it in that the imagery that he put forth was very like relatable and fam like family oriented, like familial. Um, like it always felt like there was a sort of like modern day or at the time, you know, like that he's producing this, like this sort of like almost kind of like he's showcasing what culture was like, but also uh, manipulating what culture would be like. You're almost kind of like as the as the audience and as the, the typical person around that time receiving instructions from Norma on how to exist. Um, in, in society. Like, I think that there's something for me that's nostalgic about it because of this, his uh, depictions of Santa Claus. I think that like the Santa Claus holding the Coca-Cola is, it, I forget where I saw this, but it was like this, I don't know if it was a documentary or just like a short series of something talking about the evolution of Santa Claus and how Santa Claus has been depicted throughout cultures and throughout time. And um, how, and I think Norman Rockwell was clearly in that, that discussion. 
um but it's and and same with a with a lion decker like i feel like lion decker's arrow collar man the, yeah it was like telling harvard men what to look like like it wasn't like he pulled that from existing harvard young men like it was almost like he was creating what the harvard man could and should or would look like and um so i think that i i, I feel similarly with rockwell um in terms of that kind of nostalgia in that some of it's embedded in me and then some of it is it, it's something that you can relate to because of this sort of like family instruction like giving you instruction on how to exist but maybe that's my own my no own. i think that's that's really interesting and, and right on the money um um i mean he he is romanticizing a certain section of life here obviously that at that point and you'll see him comment on on that exclusivity um in a little bit but um uh, this is an interesting one talking along those lines and and here this so this is later in the 1960s during the civil rights movement and uh, i forget the name of the little girl who had to uh, have u.s marshals escort her to school uh to de desegregate school so he actually became i wouldn't say he became political he he always represented his times and is that one of the ones you were thinking of yep his, yeah his depiction of santa claus there yeah um and so he's he was always of his time and and, and yet there's that other quality as well. So Ben Sean, Ben Sean is completely different than Norman Rockwell. Um, he, he was uh, born in Russia and then he moves to the United States and um, he lived in, in New Jersey. There's Ben. And um, these are from the late 30s and there's a book cover he also designed his own type amazing typography oh this is for a poster of sean's work just this incredibly expressive line and, and uh, it's very spare use of color. Uh, Cheney, uh, Schwerner, and Goodman were three civil rights workers in the 1960s um, who were murdered. And so this is his tribute to them. And uh, Hebrew, he was Jewish. And then some of his paintings. Depression era painting. I love how musical the actual piece is, using that background color. And more political work. Now, he, he was actively political. Uh, this is Sacco and Vanzetti, who were two Italian immigrants in the 1920s who were accused of murder, and which they didn't commit. They were union organizers, and they were put to death. Union uh, workers. Jumping ahead to the 1960s, McCarthy ran for president. One of his most famous um, images, this is Nazi brutality. And Sacco and Vanzetti again. 
and again. So much more expressive than anything I think we've been looking at. Although you can see he can do a, a realistic portrait if if need be. You know, the other this stuff's so much better than his realistic stuff. That's yeah. So, just that look at that accordion play. It was so wild. I know. Yeah, just amazing. Boy, I mean, you can just really feel, feel this one. He's able to uh, convey emotion in his art, which is hard to do. And and with the appearance of it being very quick too, that's something that um, Adele Rodriguez uh, does really well. Yes, yeah. I don't know if we're going to get to Adele. I have him prepared. <laughs> you know who else Scott mentioned is very similar. If do you know Scott's work, I think I think I've seen I think I've seen it. Um, huh. and there's a mural. Martin Luther King. That one's just gorgeous. There he was as a young man, but here here's um, a self-portrait. And so I got to meet him in the early 90s because I was art director at a book publisher and we were considering doing a book on him. And so the editor invited me along uh, to his townhouse which um, I, I was besides myself because I just loved his work. And um, uh, we were sitting and talking to him about the possibility of the book. And then he said, uh, would you mind if um, I got up and I drew while we talk? I'm on assignment. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get to see how Hirschfeld draw, which I did. But he was really short. And he walked over to this barber's chair and sat down and this was his drawing board and he had to crank himself up to get to the height of the drawing board. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. I can hear it now. <laughs> it was so funny to see. I had heard about that, but to actually witness it and he was, he and his wife were absolutely delightful. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't do the book with him. Um, so Al Hirschfeld, the important thing to note about him, he began his career in the 1920s. And so he was part of the Art Deco style. Art Deco illustration was everywhere. He didn't invent it. However, he, he um, outlived the Art Deco. By the way, it wasn't even called Art Deco in its own time. That um, term uh, came uh, later in the 1960s. Uh, a lot of people called it streamlined because of the design of um, industrial design like cars at the time or trains. Um, but he he th he began his work and the, this is some of his earliest work doing movie posters. Marx Brothers. More Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Groucho Marx, and Laurel and Hardy, and then uh, jazz, um, famous jazz players, uh, Maurice Chevalier. And so, what happened with him 
is he kept at it and he kept the style and this you know illustration moved on and he just doggedly stayed with this style because he was so good at it and eventually what happened is he was um hired by uh, the new york times to um, have the front page of arts and culture section doing theater reviews and so he did that he lived to a hundred and so he did that from i think the 50s definitely the 60s up until his death which was in i think 2001 i think he was born in 1901 and he um, died in 2001 and so he was doing all this amazing art right up until the end in the art deco style danny k fred astaire and ginger rogers the gershwin brothers tony i know you did a uh, illustration with george gershwin yeah it was um uh it was a review for nash country weekly and it was uh, an album, I think, called Summertime uh, by Willie Nelson, where he was covering uh, George Gershwin. Right. And, um, like doing George Gershwin songs. And um, so um, I had pitched the idea of the art director to have the ghost of Gershwin enveloping around uh, Willie. And that was the one we went with of the film. Yeah, it's a great, great illustration. Thank you. That means a lot. Sinatra. It's like Frank. It's like it's Frank in just such a quick. I can't do Sinatra that in so few marks, you know? It's... <laughs> I can tell you from watching him draw in pencil, and I didn't like hover over him, I wanted to, but I was actually still across the room from him, but I was watching. He he did this in pencil. It's, it's not like he was rendering heavily and then went in and erased after. Yeah, he, you, would, you would think yeah. that it would be him overdoing it and then deconstructing to this but he no he wasn't yeah i think maybe early on but by that time uh he he was just the master mm -hmm. um i heard a rumor that he puts his daughter's name in every one of his pieces but he, I'm sure that's true. He, yes okay so i was waiting to get one of those so you see this three here mm -hmm. uh and that's woody allen and, and that was annie hall um um but that three means there's three Ninas hidden oh. somewhere <laughs> in the illustration. Nina was born in the early 1950s, and to celebrate her birth, he hid her name in uh, his um, assignment for the New York Times, and somebody noticed it. And so he then began to hide Nina's sometimes by the dozen in his illustrations and we all knew this i don't know how we all knew this pre-internet i don't know how we knew anything but as a teenager i i would you know get the sunday paper and i would count the ninas the very first thing to start my sunday morning um and so we were all aware of this and so here there's three hidden i there's not an obvious one a lot of times it's in the hair it may be there yeah a student, a student in the chat i think caught it in the hair off to the right oh um there or no that's a hand above uh bogart's shoulder i think in here right like lower area there yeah yeah there it is yeah. yep good yep. call reed yep um and so this one's not signed, but here, so there's nine Ninas <laughs> hidden. Um, and, and the the funniest thing is his daughter Nina hated this as she grew up because he kept doing it for the rest of his life. And she just hated it. She hated the attention. She hated that he did it. <laughs> um, I, I can't tell what number that is there. And so here he is working right through the 60s. Bunch of uh, rock stars. <laughs> I've always loved that Ringo image. 
Is that great? The music man. He's one of those folks where it's like, it, I, did, I can't remember if somebody did an animated feature with his stuff in it, but I, I want to say that there was something that I saw uh, that was like Hirschfeld line moving on the page. Am I making that I haven't it? seen. There's a really wonderful documentary on YouTube and it's called The Lion King, Al oh, Hirschfeld. Okay. And, and I, I show it to my class and, and they fall in love with him. He, he, his life story is very interesting. He's very charming and just amazing. Harry Grant and Catherine Hepburn, the honeymooners. So you can tell pre, pre Nina, and then there's the Nina. Is there's one <laughs> we could spend all night just finding Nina's? <laughs> I could spend all night just looking at Hirschfeld pieces, I just love him. Oh my god, he's so amazing! Tony, did you have John Cash? as an instructor you know i didn't but i knew him and we spoke you know we we would speak briefly you know um but i didn't because he, he was actually lined up to um to take over whenever hirschfeld um passed and hirschfeld because he, he was almost 100 and uh he he found out and he, he was very unhappy about it so they never hired john but John would have been perfect to take this over. I think Hirschfeld was one of those illustrators that I knew that sort of like transcended, transcends the industry in that people know the art, even if they're not, you know, interested in this field. You know, I think that Hirschfeld and also Joe Chardiello, who again, uh -huh. I had the privilege of meeting thanks to, to y'all um in person i think those two those two illustrators among several others were ones that i remembered from just being a kid like seeing them around seeing them in books or um that that once i finally got to school and started learning about illustration in a more like you know clear and concise higher education kind of way i remember feeling surprised like oh i've seen this before you know like i, I saw this as a kid yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, also Norman Rockwell, there's some illustrators um, transcend the industry and become just part of the culture. Yeah, I think I saw my first uh, Joe Chardiello inside of a TV guide for, for those of you who don't know. Uh -huh. uh, a TV guide helped you to know what was on television. <laughs> yeah, Joe's amazing too. But I'll, I'll keep going. Didn't work in color much, occasionally he did. But just, just amazing work. He's one of those illustrators. I'd be curious to know, like, roughly what the number of finishes there were. You know, like. Oh my God! There must be so many. Right. Oh, and yeah. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying. Right. Like, I feel like I don't. I don't know what the number is, but I'd just be. I'd be curious to know, like, with the long, such the such big lifespan that he had, and the frequency at which he worked. In addition to that. Oh. Uh yeah he, he never stopped working yeah you know it's got to be like ten thousand plus right or it might get crazy yeah. it'd be some crazy number yeah um okay contemporary uh Saul Steinberg one of my favorites um and 
this is really funny um combining that because that's something Christoph Neiman has been doing in recent years but Saul Steinberg here he is doing it in, in uh, 1953 a very comical style And there he is in front of the mural. One of his uh, most famous images um, for New Yorker magazine, showing how um, New York centric New Yorkers are, right? So the entire country is New York, the Hudson River, Jersey, and then the Pacific Ocean. I actually just showed that piece in class the other day. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, so it looks like one of our students Googled Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld is said to have made 10 to 12,000 works in his life. Oh, my God. And that's probably just, you know, there are probably more. And thankfully, I think he saved his art. This is still Steinberg here? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, th there's the full cover. Okay, A.M. Cassandra. His real name was Alphonse um, Moreau. And he was born in either Russia or Czech Czechoslovakia, Eastern Europe for sure. And there he was. Um, but he did all these travel posters and so these are all airbrushed illustrations on these giant posters like Tony was talking about before uh, and his own lettering. And all these posters are not about the destination. They're about the um, journey because there was a great romanticism to journey back then. Here's another example. Um, and so he, he focuses in on the wheels of the train, which essentially look the same today, uh, having um, ridden uh, a New Jersey Transit for 17 years. I would never look down at the wheels uh, unless I was thinking of Cassandra, but uh, he's that's, that's what he's showing. Uh, this was for um, a, uh, a art exhibit and uh, he's still using uh, train symbolism. These caps are uh, still exist now. They're ceramic. They were glass back then. It's where the wires would attach on the electric train. And a quote from um, Cassandra is, oops, sorry, is design enters through the eyes and explodes in the brain. And then I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly, but Again, more romanticism of travel instead of showing the, you know, the beach with the palm trees and the couple on it. A hat ad. Again, travel. Um, windshield advertising. And uh, th this is a typeface he designed by for, but this is for an aperitif. This one, we're talking about art transcending uh, its time. This was done in the 1930s, and yet it looks so 60s, uh, really very pop art, right? And um, I just love the movement he gets with the bottles. More romantic travel uh, for um, an ad for um, a beauty product, very surreal and using the golden uh the the golden uh, rule here uh, for a tennis match with the incredible foreshortening and i have the uh printed i wish, wish i had the original printed this hanging up 
here at home, showing the movement of the um, of the uh, record by overlapping the type. Um, you can get oil, oilier oil. And uh, another um, alcoholic beverage. And this guy looks like he's really enjoying himself. He's literally in, in the bottle. And that's some of his type. And so he designed the Dubonnet um, character who's still in use today. And he would have him in these different environments. But what he also did in the um, Metro, which is the subway in Paris, he put up different posters of this character, I don't know if I have another one, um, of this character drinking. And so he was empty with a red drink. And then he, as the train went by and you looked out the window, your eyes would animate it because it was going by so fast. And it looked as if he was um, lifting the glass and drinking. And then his whole body turned red as the liquid uh, went down. back when cigarettes were considered good for you. And then he did move to the United States and some um, American work. Another hat ad. Just the neon quality, that's amazing. Almost looks like it's done in Illustrator. And these romantic images, ships. and then work for Container Corporation of America, which is not a romantic sounding company, but they employed all the great artists and designers of the time. And a bunch of his Harper's Bazaar covers. I like these a lot, I, I, but to me, I could tell you were talking about deadlines, they look rushed compared to the other work. Um, look at that though, eyes on Paris. So instead of showing fashion showing the eyes there's just a rough quality to these that doesn't exist in the airbrush work these look like they're oil paintings and i'll keep going and so this is really you know my introduction to this um, industry started when i was a little kid and in fact melton uh did a few children's book when I was still a child and, you know, um, autographed them for me. And, and, uh, so I was aware of the industry, you know, most of my life. Uh, there's Milton on the right and Seymour Quast on the um, left. And so, um, they were 22 year olds graduating from Cooper union, uh, and looking for work. And there were four of them to start as Milton, Seymour, uh, Ed Sorrell, who we'll get to, and uh, Reynolds Ruffin. And they formed Push Studios, which was a studio that did not exist. They were all still living at their parents' homes. Um, but they created the Pushpin Almanac, which is a parody of the Farmer's Almanac. And so they wrote it and illustrated it and sent it to art directors to show off their artistic abilities. And then it, uh, they got tired of the almanac and they started doing the pushpin graphic, which was a newsprint tabloid featuring all their art. And um, guess what? It succeeded. Uh, it was a successful promotion. They all started getting work. Uh, that was Seymour's and this is Milton's. We'll look more at all their work. Um, and this was for a talk that they gave, but, um, then they did, um, have to rent a studio because they were getting so much work. There was Milton. He died in uh, 2020 on his 92nd birthday. And, uh, he's most famous for this. And so Pushpin Studios, they all consider themselves designer illustrators. 
And so you'll see a lot of design work here too, but I'll focus in more on the illustration. Uh, this was after 9-11, a poster did for SVA. Uh, that was for the state of New York, for which he received zero money as pro bono job. Uh, but here's some hearts. And then one of his most famous, along with, uh, you know, I love New York, um, his Dylan poster, uh, which was based on a Marcel Duchamp profile self-portrait. And then he um, added um, the hair, which he um, said was based on Islamic art. Uh, but this is generally uh, listed under psychedelic. And Pushpin Studios is credited with two things. One being postmodern, meaning that they were not afraid to use historical reference and also um, psychedelia. Although I can tell you uh, for a fact that these guys, by the time they were doing this style, uh, were not hippies. Uh, they were um, illustrators, business people going to work every day with a jacket and a tie. Uh, and yet you'll see more of um, Milton's psychedelic work. That's all his hand lettering poster. Speaking of illustration, great illustrators of our time. Juilliard, Reach for the Stars, San, San Francisco Opera, posters for the School of Visual Arts. Uh, a very rare cartoon by Melton for the mostly Mozart Festival and it's Mozart sneezing. I have no idea why, but it's funny. Um, and a very Art Deco poster. And it was printed this way with the, the um, uh, double sides so that when it was hung up, it would be hung up like that. And here you really see the beginnings of um, that pushpin style, which is um, the simplified, you know, again, back to Art Nouveau and, and Japanese art, but the outlines and color inside, certainly uh, comic books as well. As an influence, here's more in that style. And here's here, you can see the relationship directly with psychedelic, uh, because that's what the subject of this Tom Wolf book is about is LSD. Ellie Gould um, portrait. He, Milton always said he could, he was not good at portraits, but that looks just like Ellie Gould. That looks just like Albert King. That looks just like Lincoln and Picasso. An exhibit of his work of nudes. Uh, another very Art Deco poster. He became the uh, owner of New York Magazine, <laughs> excuse me, with Jerome Snyder, who was the editor. And so together they created the first magazine based on a city. Now it's all over the place. I'm sure there's an LA magazine, Chicago magazine, Philadelphia, but they created the first one. What cover? Again, in that style, early book cover. And I mentioned earlier when I worked at um, New American Library, these amazing covers, uh, pen and ink and um, dye, um, but just the spot color and the detail of the pen and ink on these amazing Shakespeare covers uh, at the time Every publisher had Shakespeare because it's public domain and they all had full bleed covers. And so they hired Melton to do something different. And what he did different is all that white space um, and spot color and amazing uh, pen and ink, which he intended to look like engraving. Um, 
and it was very successful and so every other publisher then started doing Shakespeare with white backgrounds and spot illustration. And then eventually Milton was hired to do a four color Shakespeare cover. So it goes around. His portrait of Elvis. If anybody watched Mad Men, that was uh, in one of the offices on the show. His many faces of Shakespeare. And I'll skip through. These are typefaces that he designed. Uh, Take a Trip to Lotus Land. This was a promotion for the studio. Uh, ad for uh, Campari. Or poster, actually. It was die cut, the way it, it looks. Bro uh, Brooklyn Brewery is one of his most famous logos, at least in Manhattan. Uh, towards the end of his life, he did a lot of political work. He was awarded the um, Medal of the Arts, I believe it is, or the Medal of Honor. He's the only um, designer illustrator to um, be awarded that by the President of the United States. And then he was hired to do the last season of Mad Men. And what's funny about this is they wanted that psychedelic push and style, which he hadn't done for about 40 years. And he said, I don't know if I could still work in that style. I, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. So they sent him over samples of his own work to copy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's how he did this poster. That's great. Yeah. And then two, he, he designed this two weeks before he died in the hospital. Um, it was during COVID and he meant to show through typography that we're all together in this. And then Seymour, um, and there is Seymour. Seymour is still with us. He is also, uh, he's 92, so portrait. He's still working like crazy. He just put out four children's books um, this year. And he has a much more comical style than Milton, although occasionally they work in a similar style. Like how expressive that is. I think that's a tin. He he would build these tins and paint them, you know, cut them. He was also known as a Nixon artist. He did a lot of Nixon illustrations back in the day. For his uh, promotional poster for Pushpin. It's very funny because it's really promoting the whole psychedelic thing. But again, um, they, they were they were not partaking. Uh, that was for a punctuation poster. His parentheses. War is good business. Investor's son. Seymour is a uh, lifelong pacifist. In bad breath which was an anti-Vietnam uh, poster. I, I, I'm sure, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's, you know, planes bombing a village. In the, it, that's what the bad breath is. And some of his typefaces, more peace posters. This is very funny. So in 74, they broke up as a studio. And uh, Seymour kept the name and Milton kept the building. <laughs> But they, it was sort of a break, like a breakup of a marriage. And then um, soon thereafter, they had a show together, of which they had many, many shows over the years. But Seymour, in his sardonic way, um, has uh, this butcher <laughs> on the poster. Uh, and I guess that's all meant to be blood. The blood spilled of the partnership. You see LA extension cover, um, uh, anti-war, happy birthday Bach, he turns his hair into a uh, birthday cake. And for a talk that he gave, and there's Seymour as the nose. Let me just see 
Oh my god. So it's about a quarter to two. Should I stop after Seymour and see if there's any questions? Sure, yeah, that sounds great uh, to me, uh, Stephen. I wouldn't have slept if I didn't, didn't get to these two guys. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. So, yeah, I love that. Self-portrait. Uh, question, what is wrong with this picture? Anybody want to answer? What's wrong with this picture? It says it at the bottom. One of them is smoking. And then Seymour decides to be a graphic novelist in his 80s. And so he's um, published three or four graphic novels. And I'm just showing this side by side. This is about 50 years difference. Uh, visit Dante's Inferno and then Dante's Divine Comedy. And, and he has a brand new book out called Hell. And then I mentioned his children's books. Oh, typefaces, but for children. His Santa Claus. And the Pushpin uh, graphic is a book he published. These are some early paintings. By the way, I should mention for those of you who have seen Yellow Submarine, and if you haven't, uh, you should. And by the way, that was years before he was president. Um, so yeah, I'm forever grateful for you and, and also for my time at Marywood. And you know, you all changed my life for the better. Um, oh, it looks like Reed has a question. Do you know of any books or podcasts that do analysis of different movements? Interesting. There are two books. One is the Meg's book of history of graphic design, but it covers illustration. And there is a book um, called the history of illustration. I forget it's by two women authors. I forget who they are, uh, which is also, and that's recent. Uh, and then there's, um, Seymour Quast and Stephen Heller have, um, I'm blanking on the name, but they have a history book too of different, that one actually is only about style. And so if that's your interest, just to follow the style by, um, by year, that, that would be the one. And if you want anything adjacent to that, Reed, um, you know, I have a list of different podcasts that touch on illustration as well as other things that are a little bit more adjacent to that um, but some that are coming to mind are the illustration island uh, podcast as well as uh, jason seiler's face the truth podcast um, jason seiler for those of you who don't know is a really prominent caricature illustrator um, and has been for several decades now and he's got that podcast where he invites not just illustrators but other uh, people from different creative backgrounds um, and so it's not tip necessarily a podcast on movements per se, but that definitely is sprinkled throughout, um, depending on which episode you're listening to. So those are some that I know off the top of my head. But anyway, I'll let you go, Stephen. For those of you that we won't see on campus tomorrow, have a great break, a uh, great fall break. Uh, Stephen, if you ever need anything from me, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I, I wish you the best as always. Um, and, and thank you again, uh, sincerely. Absolutely. And let's set up a Zoom. It'd be great to catch up. For sure. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, well, definitely. I'll be in touch for sure. Um, everybody in the chat is saying thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Steven. Okay. Take care.